So file away fantasies of a tropical vacation. If you go cowboy like the rest of these jarheads, you'll be dead inside two weeks. I guarantee this planet is the most hostile world you've ever seen. The hype for the Avatar franchise is slowly starting to come back to the forefront. Avatar arrived on the scene more than a decade ago and blew everyone's minds when it released in 2009. Now that a significant amount of time has passed, there is a lot of mixed feelings towards the IP. Is Avatar overrated? Are all these sequels necessary? How does my boy Jake have such clean locks? I don't have the answers to these questions and that's besides the point. With Avatar The Way of Water finally coming to theaters and the development for Avatar Frontiers of Pandora well underway, I thought now would be the perfect time to bring up the movie tie-in game that released alongside the first Avatar movie, James Cameron's Avatar The Video Game. Man, that's a mouthful. This gave players a taste of what Pandora had to offer leading up to the release of the movie. Was it able to capture the same magic that the movie did across the world? Let's take an extended trip to Pandora and find out. I'm the mole. Great work, Ryder. I smell promotion in the air. Do you realize what you're doing? Think about what you're doing. Any of this look familiar? It's no secret that the movie was a visual feast for the eyes. James Cameron spent years developing and perfecting the visual effects for that film and gave audiences a beautiful and rich planet full of life ready for us to gaze our eyes upon. With that in mind, when we take a look at the video game, an effort was made by Ubisoft to capture the world created by James Cameron. It's certainly not the prettiest game out there when compared to other 2009 games, but it isn't the worst. Now of course, I'm not expecting the same level of graphical fidelity that we got from the movie since this is 7th generation hardware we are dealing with, but more times than not, the set pieces come off a bit drab. This is the case more so when exploring the world through the human's perspective. The areas you visit throughout this campaign just felt a bit grungy and uninteresting to look at. However, there are a handful of areas that do look visually stunning. A couple of areas toward the end shine bright and further engaged me in this world that I spent quite a few hours in. When playing through the Avatar campaign, I was able to experience a more diverse set of environments that were lush and included intriguing color palettes that seemed to fit Pandora a bit more. This particular section where I was able to fly a banshee throughout one area was a highlight for me. Both campaigns do feature a healthy set of flora and fauna that stays true to Pandora. Plants rule as they are littered throughout the jungle. There are even the ones from the movies that shrink to the ground when you touch them, which was always fun to interact with. All the fauna here is pulled straight from the movie, including viper wolves, hammerheads, banshees, thanators, and more, which are present almost everywhere you go. If there is one standout when it comes to the presentation, that would be the character models. Some of the human models can come off a bit generic, to the point where I wouldn't have realized who Trudy or Quaritch were if they hadn't said their names. The Navi are standout which shouldn't come as a surprise. They are detailed really well and the texture work is handled nicely. Many of the Na'vi you interact with throughout the game are all unique in their design. The outfits you get to wear and see as an avatar were also visually appealing. Facial animations and the game's animations in general came off a bit bland. Whether a character was angry, sarcastic, or remotely upset, this was only reflected in their voice. I went to the avatar station and found Monroe. He's dead and the emulator's gone. They would just continue to talk to you with the same deadpan look in their face. The only sort of emotion that they express is this little thumbs up they give you on occasion. Your version of Ryder is no exception to this, which brings me to the next point. Avatar features a light character customization that makes Ryder cater to you. There are 12 different versions of a male and female version of Ryder you can choose from that serves as both your human and avatar form. I chose a male during my RDA playthrough and a female during my avatar playthrough, which exposed a small detail that I happened to notice during my second playthrough. The pronouns don't change whether you are a male or a female. Everyone refers to Ryder as he or him. Don't understand. Your human body is dead. But you are Navi now. He will never be Navi. This one was born, Sky People. This wasn't something that happened a lot, but when it did, it completely broke any immersion I had as all I could think about was the pronouns not changing. It just seemed like a lazy omission from the development team. The sound effects and music were never anything to write home about. A lot of the sound effects really came off a bit generic and never really provided anything special. The only ones unique to the game will be played on repeat and is sure to be burned into your brain once you play enough. Ah! 
Sadly, there's no Velociraptor sound effect from Jurassic Park for the dire horses. The music really just sat in the background for me. Except for the times when the game would play music from the Avatar movie, which is rare, nothing really stuck out to me. It didn't encourage me to explore or yearn for that sense of freedom. It never roared for the highly climactic events. It was just there. For the voice cast, a few familiar voices from the movie returned to reprise their respective roles for the game. Sigourney Weaver as Grace, Michelle Rodriguez as Trudy, and Stephen Lang as Quaritch. The only other voice I was able to recognize was Kimberly Brooks from the Mass Effect series as Kendra Midori. There are some other recognizable voice actors here, such as Nolan North and Roger Craig Smith, but I was never able to recognize them. Some of the voice actors, particularly for the Na'vi, felt like they didn't really fit their characters. One instance came early on during the Avatar campaign when you encounter Morali. I am sorry, and I mean this with the utmost respect, but whoever is doing the voice for her does a terrible impersonation of a Na'vi. Good of you, but I fear Beidamo not happy to see you. She's doing her best, but I couldn't help but bust out laughing once the conversation was over. With that being said, a lot of the dialogue in this game is extremely one note, serving really to point you in the direction of your next objective. Ryder themselves pulls off a lot of jokes that are extremely cringy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yo no hablo, Navi. I'm looking for Longare. The conversations are also done in real time, which creates some pretty hilarious moments during some serious talks. Now let's turn to the technical side of Avatar. The biggest elephant in the room, which you guys may have noticed by now, is the game's frame rate. While the game looks pretty most of the time, the amount of foliage on screen can come at a cost of major frame rate dips. For a good portion of the game, it can hold a steady 30 frames per second, but when you get to more dense parts of Pandora or get into some extremely heavy combat encounters, the frame rate can drop significantly. Never to the point where it was unplayable, but it happened enough that it became quite frustrating to deal with. There was also a decent number of distracting bugs during my time on Pandora. Nothing game breaking, but some that really made me question the game's AI at times. No, I think I can still Enough. do this. You will die, human. I can do this. While the Avatar movie isn't widely praised for its narrative, the story that we get from the game makes the movie look like a masterpiece in comparison. Just like majority of movie tie-in games, the game released a little over two weeks before the movie. However, you wouldn't need any knowledge of the movie since this game takes place about two years before those events. It just helps to know about it going into the game. In the first hour, you get acquainted with the people that are running the show at one of the RDA camps, and you get to explore a small section of Pandora through a series of go here, do this, go here, kill that type of quest. Once you get into your avatar body, you meet Dr. Harper, who plays an interesting role in both campaigns. After completing even more fetch quests, you run into your one and only big decision that will shape the rest of the game. After the RDA bombed a local Navi village, you meet with Dr. Harper, where you find out that he is a mole for the Navi. Falco, one of the higher ups for the RDA, commands you to kill Harper. This is the moment where the game shifts into two different paths. Do you side with the RDA, or do you betray your people and stick with being an avatar to put a stop to Falco? I played through both campaigns and was extremely disappointed in how both stories played out. To start, the RDA and Avatar campaigns are the exact same. You're searching for these trees around Pandora called harmonics. Through these harmonics, you narrow down the location of the Well of Souls, which is essentially a different version of the Tree of Souls from the movie. I mean, it's not even a well, it's another freaking tree. Both campaigns have different reasons for doing so. The RDA is crafting an emulator that will connect with Awa and sever the connection to the Na'vi people. The Na'vi are looking for the Well of Souls in order to prevent the humans from doing the same plan as the RDA storyline. This makes sense during the RDA campaign because they have no idea where anything is on Pandora, but for the same exact story to play out during the Avatar campaign makes zero sense. Shouldn't the Na'vi know where the location of the Well of Souls is from the beginning? Whether or not it's a dormant site, this is their planet. You're telling me no one would know where one of the key locations that they connect to Awa should be? Both even follow the same exact structure for the final act. You go to a different camp with a new leader, go kill three commanders on the opposing side, fly a badass vehicle for two minutes, and reach the Will of Souls. The game even breaks its own lore by having Ryder easily take control of Turok Makto. 
which if you remember from the first movie, was a big deal. Now I'm not a stickler for Avatar lore by any means, but again, this was such a lazy and inconsistent choice on Ubisoft's end. There really isn't much substance here, and the story has a few glaring plot holes that are clearly glossed over. This is primarily an issue during the RDA campaign. There's a revelation about halfway through the story that Dr. Harper is alive and needs to be stopped. As I mentioned before, Dr. Harper is one of the avatars you meet early in the game. When you side with the RDA, he is shot off a cliff and is presumed dead. Him surviving wasn't that big of a twist. It was the nature of how Dr. Harper was brought back up. Not once had the game made it seem like Dr. Harper was a threat and all of a sudden he is brought up out of nowhere in a conversation for me to kill him. At this point in the game, I had already forgotten who Dr. Harper was. I had to scrub through old footage to see who the hell they were talking about. There's another twist towards the latter half of the game where Falco goes rogue and kills the scientist trying to find the Well of Souls. He instead goes for it himself. While Falco can come off as a dick, him going rogue seems completely out of left field and doesn't even make sense this late in the game. We have the last harmonic that will point us to the Well of Souls. There was literally no reason for any of this to happen at all, and he doesn't even know where the Well of Souls is. If that's the case, why didn't we just let Falco take us on a series of rides to the Well of Souls in the first place? This was obviously an attempt to make the story more engaging, but in the end, it just made everything inconsistent and flat out unnecessary. Lastly, how is Grace okay with any of this? If you guys remember Grace's character from the movie, you know she was all about her science and didn't really care about war. It was inevitable, sure, but all she wanted was her samples and to make peace with the Navi. She made it clear that she didn't want any Marines snooping into her work. How is she just fine with us murdering her avatars, cutting off an essential connection with Awa, and even more bloodshed coming both ways? That doesn't fit her character at all. Moving on to the Avatar campaign, there really wasn't any major gripes I had with the story per se, given it's the exact same. It really had more to do with the characters and how bad the missions can be. The mission structure for both campaigns can become highly repetitive. Before you can reach a harmonic, you have to collect three shards of unobtainium. In order to get these shards, you have to complete a series of, you guessed it, go here, do this, go here, kill that objectives before someone tells you where the shard is. Rinse and repeat four different times. As you can see, this core structure carries the main loop of the game. It even exposes an element in gaming that I find highly annoying, which is you are the only one capable of doing anything around here. A lot of games do this, don't get me wrong, but it's the nature in which this game is presented that really bothered me. You're telling me that you are willing to send a Navi, not even a true Navi, around on fetch quests that are integral to your tribe's survival? And I have the perfect example of this. About halfway through the game, there's an RDA camp where they are turning the animals against us. Beidamo, one of the Navi leaders, asks me to go to a camp and fight any corrupted animals there. Not a big deal, since there's already Navi there who just so happy happen to stop helping as soon as I get there? Outstanding. Once I defeat the corrupted Thanator, guess who's waiting for me on the other side of the camp? Oh, it's Beidamo, just standing there like a giant blue idiot. Speaking of which, let's talk about Beidamo. He is an absolute dick the entire game. He's pissed off at you because you, the fake Navi, get lucky and don't die while true Navi do. Like bro, chill out. Why do you still want me running errands for you if you don't trust me until the very end of the game? Again, I truly wish that there was more substance here for both stories. It feels lazy on Ubisoft's end to rehash the exact same story twice. I was never able to figure out the development time for the game, but I wouldn't doubt it if they were rushed to meet the deadline before the movie's release. This would possibly explain them using the same story twice, but I could never confirm so. I don't even know if anyone bothered playing the game on both sides, let alone finish both campaigns, but it really felt like a waste of time to me. If I had to choose only one, I would honestly go with the Avatar story since you are playing as what should be the main selling point of the game. If I honestly started with that one, I probably wouldn't be super hard on it. What I wish they could have done differently is instead of splitting the campaign into two different parts, have it to where the player can switch to them interchangeably. This most likely would have mitigated my frustrations that came from essentially repeating the same campaign twice. Of course, change the story for the Avatar campaign, but being able to switch between an Avatar and a human would have allowed players to get a taste for both sides without having to completely start over from scratch and experience the same thing over again. Overall, the game took me about 12 hours to complete on both sides. There's absolutely no sense of replayability here, 
You could 100% all the areas, but there's no collectibles of any sort, so you're not really given much incentive to go back and explore the numerous areas. The only thing that you can do is an additional mode called Conquest. This sees you using credits to buy three different units to take over parts of Pandora, which net you rewards for single player. I didn't spend too much time in this mode, but if you're someone who gets a kick out of this stuff, it's worth checking out. There was a multiplayer mode for the game that can't be accessed anymore since I'm assuming the servers were shut down some time ago. But to be completely honest, with the way the game's combat works, which I will dive into next, I most likely wouldn't have checked it out. For the gameplay, I'm going to split this into two different parts, the gameplay for the RDA and the avatar. Let's start with the RDA. As the humans, you'll find yourself playing the game as a third person shooter. You're given a nice selection of weapons to choose from, which can range from a pistol, your default weapon, rifles, a grenade launcher, flamethrower, shotgun, and a nail gun. The gun controls, while fine, can feel a bit floaty. What really doesn't help is the lack of a button to aim down the sights with. You're firing off the hip the entire game as a human and an avatar. The only feature that sees you zooming in is one mechanic that I rarely used, which allows you to identify different objects and animals around Pandora and add them to a Pandorapedia, your in-game encyclopedia. The Pandorapedia provides the player with tutorials, in-depth descriptions of flora and fauna on Pandora, along with audio logs that you earn after each mission. I missed a chance to take out Harper. He almost destroyed a willow tree. That would have killed our chance at finding the dormant site. Going back to combat, enemies are usually moving all over the place, so it made it a bit hard to keep up with them at times. Something I really wish the humans did have was a dedicated melee button. There were countless times when Navi or Viper Wolves would close in and start wailing on me. Sure, a shotgun would do the trick, but being able to throw a punch or swing my elbow would have been nice. There's also a nice selection of vehicles to make traversing Pandora quick. You have buggies and ATVs in most areas, while certain sections have access to boats and scorpions to fly. You can also take the dragon for a spin during the final mission, but only for a couple minutes. I never checked to see if you could fly it outside of that. When it comes to playing as an avatar, you're still in that third person point of view, but this time the focus is more on a melee build. You're given a nice selection of melee weapons ranging from a dual blade, club and axe, along with a staff. No matter which weapon you have, the melee combat in Avatar is actually really plain. You mash the right shoulder button a few times and watch the same animations play over and over again. No combos or anything like that, which just made melee combat a bit boring after a while. There is at least a special move that you can pull off when you land enough hits on your enemies. There's also a couple of ranged weapons, your bow being the default weapon and probably the best bet when fighting enemies. The gripe I had was, again, you can't aim down the sights and with a weapon that requires accuracy, this mechanic was desperately needed. It does zoom in a little bit when you hold down the trigger long enough and each body part is highlighted with a yellow diamond so you know where you're shooting, but it was not nearly as accurate as it could have been. Your other ranged weapons also include a machine gun and a crossbow. There's a little less variety when it comes to traveling with a dire horse, serving as your main way of getting across every area you visit. Some areas do change things up a bit, allowing you to ride a banshee, and even one small section where you can ride a thanator, but this would have been nice additions to other areas as well. When starting both campaigns, they are presented almost the same way in terms of combat. However, what I learned quick is that my playstyle had to change quickly when playing as an avatar. As a human, I was used to being able to rush my enemies head on with the type of weapons I had. Playing as an avatar, I had to hold back because I soon realized that I couldn't rush head on in a fight with a bunch of soldiers or else my health would drop rapidly. The combat in Avatar overall is actually pretty simplistic and never really posed much of a challenge. I will start out by saying that the game's AI is nothing special. Majority of the enemies will rush you straight on while those that have ranged weapons will attack you from a distance. The only real challenge that comes from combat is when groups of enemies attack you at once. There's quite a bit of variety with the humans, since everything on Pandora wants to kill you and eat your eyes for jujubes. When you're not contending with the Navi, you'll be fighting the flora and fauna spread throughout the map. This variety is lost during the Avatar campaign, but it makes sense. What else is there really for the Navi to fight besides the humans and some corrupted animals? 
Boss fights here can be a bit hit or miss. The RDA presents some exciting boss fights against Pandora's many beasts. Hammerheads and Thanators are quick and are some of the few fights that will truly keep you on your toes. The final boss is a bit anticlimactic as you fight Falco in his human form and it all really boils down to a shooting match until you get his health down to zero. The boss fights during the Avatar campaign, while slim in comparison, were a real bummer. There aren't too many traditional boss fights here, instead you'll tackle things in a series of repetitive sequences such as a dragon you fight early on in the campaign. You jump on top of the dragon only to mash a button to cause some damage. Literally anything extra to this fight would have made it remotely fascinating instead of repeating the same sequence four times. The only boss fight that really provides a challenge is when you're hit with three amp suits at once. Your health can drop almost instantly if you were to take them head on, so this was one of the few fights where I heavily relied on my different skills. To help get through these tough combat sequences, you have an ability called Recover, which instantly revives you when you die. You gather this by collecting cell samples, which enemies occasionally drop upon death, or you gather them from plants while you explore. Collect 10 and you gain one use of Recover. Luckily if you run out, the checkpoint system isn't too bad. Another thing that is similar between the humans and avatars were the skills that you have. This was another element that I sadly found disappointing because each ability is exactly the same between the two. There's a sprint, which I find pretty ridiculous as a skill. I honestly can't see why this wasn't given a dedicated button. At least it recharges fast. A couple of essential skills replenished your health while another one turns you invisible. There's one that improves damage while another reduces the amount that you take another that knocks enemies back or stuns them for a short period of time, and both have a version of an airstrike that either rains down a bunch of missiles or dozens of animals swarm your enemies at once. Lastly, one that was unique to the avatar that I never really used was calling a viper wolf to aid you in combat. At their base level, they can help quite a bit, but as you progress throughout the game, you earn upgrades to both your weapon and skills. Upgrades come fast in avatar. Almost everything you kill or destroy nets you a decent amount of XP, while missions dish out a ton. The catch is you're not given any sort of upgrade points. After each level up, a random set of skills and weapons get upgraded to another level. This means a few things. The first is you often get upgrades for skills and weapons you may not use, which means that sometimes a level up can be useless. When it comes to weapon upgrades, some can be pretty minuscule. I mean, come on. What the hell is that? Finally, everyone who plays Avatar follows the same exact upgrade path so there's no real individuality to your character. The one positive thing I can say about the upgrades is that different outfits are unlocked once you reach a certain level. For the first three, they are pretty straightforward and scale with you. Once you unlock the higher level armor, this is when you begin making decisions based on what your main priority should be. Protection, vitality, and mobility. If we go back to exploring Pandora, while the game isn't exactly an open world, there's a handful of dense areas to explore. Getting to your next objective could be a bit confusing though since the only guide between missions was an arrow pointing towards the objective's direction on the minimap. There could be times when the objective might be above or even below you because you took the wrong turn a while back. This would have been fine if there was something worthwhile to check out off the beaten path. Instead, it just left me frustrated that I had to waste more time getting back to the mission objective. There is a map of the entire area that you can access, but there was never a point where I constantly checked back and forth with it. I just wish there was a better way of indicating whether or not you're on the correct path without straight up telling you where to go. Perhaps just little markers spread across the map to help push you in the right direction? If there is one thing I wish the game took advantage of, it would be flight. This was a major component in the first film, and is something that was severely lacking in the game. It possibly would have been too much for 2009 hardware to handle at the time, but more flying sections really would have been nice here. If there's one positive I will give about exploring Pandora, it's that the areas you go to certainly never feel empty. There's always something going on in the environment, whether it be RDA grunts fighting off a group of Navi, or animals roaming the land, which made exploring worthwhile at times. While Avatar isn't the worst movie tie-in game that I've played, I was left disappointed by what Ubisoft put together. It's a game that painfully screams mediocre. While it can look gorgeous at times, the up and down frame rate can damper a smooth experience. The story for both the RDA and Avatar are the exact same and are uninteresting as a whole. And the combat is just extremely bare bones with a lot of key features missing. 
I wasn't really expecting much from an Avatar game, especially since it's a movie tie-in game and we all know the reputation that comes from movie tie-in games. I was just hoping for something a bit better than what was presented here, especially when it came to the story. Ubisoft is the developer for the next Avatar game, which is scheduled to release in the next couple of years. Knowing their recent track record, along with the fact that they aren't tied to meeting a certain release date, means that gamers will hopefully get a better trip to Pandora through video games. For now, we're just stuck with this mediocre title. Well guys, that's it for the video. I hope that you enjoyed this look back on Avatar. If so, please be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment down below. I would really like to hear everyone's experience when it comes to Avatar, whether it be for the movie or the video game. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you guys next time.